Hi everyone and welcome to the very first episode of the Bloom After Dark podcast. I'm really excited to be sharing this moment with you guys, but I already shared this moment before because I actually already recorded this video, but something happened with the footage and I just couldn't get it all back. So this is my second time recording this video. So I just want to say before I even get into any of the details or anything, first of all, thanks for watching. Thank you for supporting my podcast and my channel. Um, you can go check out some of my other videos that aren't podcast related. But yeah, just thank you for coming here today and I really hope that you enjoy this video. Before I get into the podcast and before I get into the case, I just want to say again thank you for supporting and also some information about the podcast. In this podcast, we'll talk about murder mystery, true crime, every once in a while, conspiracy theory, and just stuff that I really find interesting. Stuff that I've always kind of wanted to bring to my channel, but my channel is like pretty lighthearted and it's just like I only really post when I feel like it or when there's something that I want to post. Like this YouTube thing is not something that I do because I want to become famous or anything. It's just something I do for fun. So this, I was going to make a whole different channel and whatever the case may be, but I decided, you know, just once a month, I'll post an episode of this podcast and you guys can feel free to check it out. Um... Like I said, this podcast is going to be about all types of different things. Um, I will be putting timestamps in the description box below, so be sure to look for timestamps in the description if there's a part that you want to skip over or whatever the case may be. Also, in the description, there will be some more information about the case, and there you can expect to find the articles that I use to put the case together as long, um, along with any like videos or anything else in there that have to do with the article. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this video, you know, my second time doing it, I hope it's worth it. Also, before I start any video, any podcast, any case, if it's a case that's like really graphic or it involves like certain things that I feel like could trigger someone, I'll always put a warning before I start the video. So if you see a warning, you have to figure out whether you can watch it or not. It's something that you have to do on your own and check in with yourself. And if you feel like you can't watch it, you can go watch some of my other videos or you can just wait until the next episode. This is the only warning that you're going to get for this video. This video could be super triggering to certain people. It does involve murder, it involves incest, very graphic details of murder, and things that really could bother you. So if you're not comfortable with that, please just click out now and we can try again next video or you can go watch some of my other videos. Without further ado, let's get into the case. So today we're going to be talking about the Jacques Mosser case. Honestly, there's not much that I can really say about this case without spoiling it for you. So yes, Jacques Mosser is the murder victim that we will be talking about today. A few of the main characters in this story are Jacques Mosser, who was the man who was murdered, his wife Candy Mosser, and her nephew Melvin Powers. Basically, this story is about a woman who had an incestuous relationship with her nephew and is suspected of killing her husband. That is Candy Mosser. She is, like, the star right now. Um, there's a lot of series on, like, Investigation Discovery, which is, like a, like, a true crime channel, basically, that have done, like, an episode on this case. There's not too much on YouTube really about this case that people have put but there's so many articles and if you guys want to read any of the articles like I said they're in the description box below. Candace Candy Mosser was born on February 18, 1920 in Butchanan, Georgia. It was suspected that Candy was actually born before 1920 but no one knew her real age because she refused to say. Honestly back then it was like you know I don't know if you guys ever heard this but it's like oh you never asked a woman her age she was one of those women like she was not about to tell you so don't even ask. Not much was known about Candy's origins no one really knew much about her I mean people knew that she was from Georgia and blah 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 but no one really knew if she was poor if she was rich like what her lifestyle was like but it was suspected that she was poor and that's why she grew up the way that she was and the way she became to be which is basically she married for money and blah 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 but no one really knew anything about her it was like basically she just appeared one day and was like hey guys i'm candy i live here now eventually candy grew up and she would go on to become a socialite she basically a social climb until she got to the top 
if you don't know what a socialite is, basically a socialite is someone who is in the crowd. There's someone who usually has money. They're usually, you know, very high status where they're from or even around the world. And Candy went on to become one of these people. A good example of a socialite is someone like Kim Kardashian or something. Like Candy went on to become someone like that you know it was her thing she threw parties she loved parties so she wound up getting married for the first time through you know being a socialite and she met all these rich people and blah blah blah. so she did wind up getting married for the first time i say for the first time because she wound up getting married two times after this and this really goes along i'm adding this detail because it goes along with the story and you'll see why later so yes she does get married for the first time however this marriage did wind up ending in divorce and candy and her first husband split now it's not clear when her and her first husband split up there's not a lot of information on her husband her first one or their marriage i mean it's not super important but the detail of their divorce is super important in the case because this is when she meets jacques mosser this is when jacques mosser comes into the case jacques mosser was a texas businessman who had banks and financing companies from the state of texas to the state of florida he was super wealthy and was worth over 33 million dollars at the time of him and candy meeting so okay she knew that she caught a big one okay there's not much that's known about Shock Monster. You guys have to understand this case took place a little while ago, over, I'm pretty sure over like 40 years ago. This happened a really long time ago. And also it wasn't like they were super famous or anything before the case. So it's like, there's not a lot of details of their life. Basically I was scrapping for anything I could find. But it was said that Jacques Mosser was a super hardworking businessman and he was super into just helping people out, especially children, because he grew up super poor with a single mother who was widowed. And so he learned to just grind and to work from his mom, from her work ethic. And that's how he became a millionaire and had all of his company. Prior to his marriage to Candy, Jacques Mosser was actually married one time prior, and he did have six kids from that marriage, but the marriage did not work out, and the two wound up being divorced. So it wasn't sure, you know, it's not clear the timeline of Jacques' divorce, neither is it of Candy's, but it was suspected that were they both divorced within, like, you know, a couple months of meeting each other, just because it said that when they both met each other in spring of 1949, they were both already divorced and they bonded over recently being divorced. Keyword there is recently. So yes, Candy and Jacques did meet in spring of 1949 and it was said that as soon as they met, they hit it off with each other, okay? They both loved each other. Of course, they both, you know, had high status and they both honestly had a lot to offer each other. You know, Candy was super pretty, very trophy wife material. She was blonde. She's a bombshell. She already made a little bit of a name for herself and, you know, she had... A little bit of her own bag so Jacques liked that he found that attractive and Candy of course you know Jacques could have been the ugliest thing out there but the man had money and he was a big fish in the sea so Candy okay Candy loved that about him and they honestly you know they bonded super quickly I'm saying that like I was there I was not there obviously but yeah it was said that they bonded super quickly and it was said that they also married within three months of you know knowing each other so Candy and Jacques did wind up getting married in summer of 1949 after just, you know, being with each other just for a little bit, a little bit of time, and they start their life together. After Jacques and Candy get married, you know, they basically start their life together. The two move in with each other, you know, Jacques becomes, I mean, Jacques becomes, Candy becomes stepmom to Jacques' previous children. They're one big happily family. Like I said, they all already resided in Houston, so they decide to move in with each other. So Jacques and Candy, like I said, Candy's used to throwing parties. She's used to living the socialite, you know, life. And Jacques, you know, he's trying to put himself out there a little more, make some friends. So the two buy a 28-bedroom mansion in Houston, Texas. A 28-bedroom mansion. What do you need 28 bedrooms for? You will never, ever, ever see the other person that lives in that house with 28 bedrooms. But that's what they wanted, okay? And this is where Candy throws her parties. Candy is known, Candy and Jacques were known for throwing like huge parties when being with each other. So they throw all these huge parties there. And the two, you know, they gain attention in the neighborhood. They gain traction. People love them. They're always at their parties. Kids are always there, you know, everything. They're all having a great time. 
Like I said before, Jacques loved children. He was always looking to expand his family. He was also always looking to help children out in any way that he could just because of his struggles from when he was younger. So one day Jacques is watching the news. This is where the 28 bedroom mansion comes into handy. He was watching the news and he seen that these kids had recently been orphaned. So four children had recently been orphaned after their father killed their mother and one of their siblings. So obviously, you know, their father went to jail for the murders and they had no parents. Their mother's dead, their father's in jail. So the children were looking to be adopted, basically. The police were looking to get the children adopted. So Jacques, you know, being caring and loving and, you know, also having a 28 bedroom mansion, he goes and he adopts the children along with Candy. And the police department, the town, nobody had a problem with, you know, letting them adopt these kids because, like I said, they were well-known around town. Everybody knew them. And, you know, everybody knew that they would take great care of the kids. So he adopts all four of the kids, and his family goes from being, you know, him and Candy and their six kids to him, Candy, and their ten kids. At this point, his six kids are now, you know, basically almost out of the house. They're a lot older than the four kids he's about to adopt. And so, you know, they become, like, an even bigger happy family. Before I continue with the story, I just want to say, if there's any background noise, please just try to ignore it. I'm trying to record the story. My family's not cooperating, so yeah, the more you know, thanks. So anyways, let's get back into the story. So the Mosser family at this point, you know, they're going strong. Everything's going great. This is where Melvin Lane Powers makes his fabulous entrance into the story. So Melvin Lane Powers was born on January 13, 1942 in Birmingham, Alabama, and he was the biological nephew of Candy Mosser and the nephew by marriage to Jacques Mosser. So when you look him up, like on Google or anything, it, they describe him as a businessman. But from what I read, he was more so of a con artist. He pretty much did what he needs to do to make money. Are we mad at him? I don't, I don't, not yet, at least. So anyways, yeah, he was a con artist. Um, at one point, he was in the Navy, but I don't know what happened with that. It just said that he was in the Navy for like a year or two, and then he just started to become, you know, do the conning jobs or whatever. So one day, he goes to do this job in Michigan. You know, he's going to get paid money. So he goes to do the job, and he winds up getting arrested for it. It doesn't say specifically what he was doing, but it does say that it was something that he, you know, could get arrested for, obviously, because he got arrested for it. So he goes to jail in Michigan for 90 days, and when he gets out, this is where he kind of pushes into Candy and Jock's life. Like I said before, Melvin was born in Alabama, so he pretty much lived in Alabama all his life. He really didn't know anywhere else. So he gets pinned up in Michigan. He obviously, he doesn't have any family up there. He doesn't really know anybody up there, and he's like kind of stranded. So he calls his mom, and you know, he's telling her like whatever, whatever the case may be but she can't help him out because like i said before they really didn't have money like that and stuff like that so he was like basically just stranded so his mom just tells him you know you have an aunt in texas she's rich she has a rich husband she has a 20 bedroom mansion still can't get over that fact and you know just call her maybe she could help you out so melvin does that he calls down candy and he's like you know i don't know what he said to her obviously i wasn't there but he calls candy up and within a couple of months of that phone call of Melvin calling Candy, he's down there living with Melvin, Candy, and their kids. So Melvin moves down there to Texas with his aunt Candy and her husband Jacques and their kids, and everything's going great. You know, like I said, the family's super famous where they live. Um, you know, they're socialite, well known, they're wealthy, they're throwing all these parties. Everyone loves them, and now they have this great nephew. You know, he's down there, he's helping out. Jacques even gets Melvin a job at his company. Like I said, he owned multiple companies, multiple banks and financing companies, whatever. So Jacques gets him a job with him. He's like, you know, I'm gonna help my nephew out, blah, blah, blah. So everything's going great until it starts to go nasty, okay? So Melvin and Candy start their affair as soon as he gets down there. Obviously, you know, not as soon as he gets down there. It wasn't like the first day and Melvin was like, come on, Candy, let's go into the bedroom. No, it wasn't that, you know, obviously it wasn't that early, but they start their relationship, you know, really soon after he gets down there, less than months. Obviously, when I say relationship, you know what they're doing. I'm trying to keep it PG-13, okay? There's people watching, there's children probably watching, but yeah, they start this relationship, this little nasty thing going on, and Melvin's from Alabama, like, don't even get me started, but yeah, so they start this thing going on, 
and no one knows about it they keep it such a good secret they're sneaking around the house all the time like i said 28 bedroom mansion you know you really don't have to cross paths with each other i don't even see how this is going on you don't even have to see each other like just nasty but yeah they start this relationship no one knows that it's going on Jacques doesn't suspect anything candy's not making it obvious melvin you know he's he's living the good life and everything's going fine it's going nasty but it's going fine Jacques starts to become increasingly suspicious of Candy. Like I said before, he was suspicious that she was having an affair, but he didn't know who it was with, and he definitely didn't think that it was with Melvin because it's like, why would she have an affair with her with her nephew? But anyways, yeah, so he starts to become super suspicious, and he's actually starting to watch Candy a lot more and watch her moves. So Candy, you know, she's over here. She's living the life. And her and Melvin start to get a lot more serious. She is buying him stuff. She's buying him all this nice extravagant stuff. You know, he has to look the part if he wants to be with Candy Mosser. She even goes as far as to get Melvin plastic surgery to tweak his looks to how she wanted them. Melvin, one of his most famous surgeries, which this actually comes up a lot, he got his ears pinned back. And he got the surgery because Candy didn't like the fact that his ears stuck out. And so, basically, she made him get them pinned back. She was like, if you want to be with me, you got to go get those ears pinned back. And so, she was like, you know, her and Melvin were basically, she was giving him the money. She was giving him everything that he wanted. And she was, you know, he was giving her the, you know, you know what I mean. So, yeah, and it was just, they were being so secretive, but like so obvious at the same time. And Jacques still just did not notice. Just really quick, I kind of want to go into the details of his surgery. I don't know why, but I just find it so funny that Candy made him do this. So, when someone gets their ears pinned back, here's a picture on the screen. Basically, as you can see in the image on the left, the girl's ears are like outwards a little bit more, which is totally fine. I mean, I think that, I think a guy is cute when he has like, you know, the little outwards ears. But, okay, so on the right side, as you can see, that's after her surgery, after she got them pinned back. Basically, that's what Candy had Melvin do. And, like, I'm like, Jock, how? 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 Like, you just didn't notice? You didn't notice all this was going on? So, like I said, yeah, Jacques is super suspicious, whatever, whatever. So, he goes to work one day, and like I said, he owns all these companies, so he's the manager. He oversees all of these places, and he goes to work one day, and he hears some employees talking, and it's not like, you know, talking, talking, no, they're talking. They're talking about him, they're talking about his wife, and they're talking about his wife's nephew. So, one of the employees tells Jacques, basically, that Melvin is going to work and he's bragging about sleeping with candy basically he's telling everyone that he's messing with his aunt that she's giving him whatever he wants and he's telling everyone that he's really only doing it for the money because she spoils him she gets him whatever he wants you know it's a win-win and so yeah he's over there bragging and jock is obviously disgusted one two he's embarrassed because like his employees they all know that his wife is not only having an affair but she's having an affair with her nephew that's Alabama 3.5, 2.0. That's a robot at this point. That is just disgusting. So he goes home. He doesn't say anything, but he goes home and he goes to Candy's diary. Because he knows that Candy has a diary. He knows exactly where he, uh, where Candy keeps it. He knows where to look for it. And he goes to her diary because he wants to confirm it for himself. You know, workplace talk is different from actually confirming it and it being confirmed. So he goes home. He looks in Candy's diary and he starts reading and he finds all the evidence he was looking for. That's why it's like, if you think you're being cheated on, like, you know, like people be going through like the phone and stuff, like, you know what you're looking for. And if you find it, you can't even be mad. So Melvin, I mean, Melvin, Jacques found everything he was looking for. Candy had a very, very, very detailed description about what her and Melvin were doing all the stuff she was buying him, just everything. This woman had an entire Wetpad story in her diary, okay? This was Wetpad before Wetpad existed, literally. Oh, by the way, if you guys want to read my Wetpad reading list, I'll give it to y'all, I'll give it to y'all. So anyway, so yeah, so she was just detailing it and detailing it, okay? She was in here writing a whole book, and Jacques is mad. He's infuriated. I would be mad too. That's embarrassing, and that's just nasty. So as soon as he finds this out, he raises hell in the house. He kicks Melvin out of the house and he's like, you gotta go. Like, you cannot stay here. Melvin 
loses everything within seconds. He loses his job. He loses his place of living. He's kicked out. Like, okay, Jacques was like, go. Goodbye, peasant. So, anyways. So, Jacques kicked Melvin out. And, of course, Melvin was not happy about this. He was like, how are you going to kick me out? Him being all entitled and stuff. He's like, how are you going to kick me out, sir? So, he kicks Melvin out. Melvin gets kicked out. And the police are called. Because, obviously, Melvin is not leaving, like... He's not leaving willingly. I wouldn't leave a 28-bedroom mansion willingly either. You'd probably have to drag me out of there. I, you know, I agree. I wouldn't do anything to get myself kicked out, but, yeah, that's another story. So, anyways, Melvin gets kicked out. The police are called, and Melvin threatens Jacques. So, this is a very important piece as well because it, like, kind of, it goes on with the story as the story progresses. So, as the story progresses, oh my god, as the story progresses, so, Melvin threatens Jock. He basically tells him, like, listen, you're kicking me out now, but I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna be the owner of this mansion, period. He didn't say it like that, but yes, that's what he said. He told Jock that he would come back to the mansion as the owner very soon. And, of course, this scared Jock because, first of all, like, he's being threatened. If you're bold enough to threaten somebody in front of the police... I don't even want to mess with you because I know you're about that life. He was definitely about that life because he threatened him from the police. So the police take Melvin away. He doesn't get arrested, but he, you know, they take him away because he's doing too much. So they move him out of the house. Melvin and Candy, Melvin and Candy, oh my God, I keep getting the names mixed up. Melvin and Jacques at this point, they're like, their marriage is on the edge. Remember the detail that Melvin threatened Jacques because it is very important for later. But yeah, so um, at this point, Jacques and Candy, their marriage is on the rocks. They don't trust each other anymore. Jacques definitely doesn't trust Candy because he's like, first of all, girl, you had an affair, but not only just any other affair. I could have took that, but you had an affair with your nephew. Like, that's just something I can't take. And Candy didn't trust Jacques either because she thought that he was having an affair too. But she had no evidence against him. Like, Jacques, he had all the evidence. And Candy really had nothing against him. It was just a suspicion that she had. And it was probably just her saying that to, like, cast the blame. Because she knows she was out there being nasty and dirty. So, Candy and Jacques, they wound up just separating from each other. Because they really, nothing was working out anymore. They really couldn't, like, get it together. They just, it was done at this point. So, remember earlier when I told you that the couple had, like, multiple vacation homes around the country and stuff? So, Jacques winds up moving to one of those vacation homes. He leaves the house to Candy because Candy kept the kids. Um, You know, she didn't really work or anything. She didn't really have anything else to do. So, she did keep the kids and then Jacques moved out, you know, to go handle his business or whatever. So, he moved to their vacation home in Key Biscayne, Florida, which is, like very close to Miami remember that because that comes up in the end too um so yeah he moves there and he they decided that they would just have you know joint custody of the kids whatever the case may be Jacques would come see them you know every weekend and then every once in a while Candy would bring the kids to see Jacques and that's how it worked out for a while because they really just couldn't get back together into the husband and wife thing and there were a lot of secrets Jacques and Candy both decided not to get divorced for a couple of reasons. One of the bigger reasons was because obviously in the divorce, Jacques had a lot more to lose. He was worth $33 million and it wasn't like no one was really sure what Candy's net worth was worth around that time. But they didn't have a prenup, like nothing was signed to like keep her away from the money. So he would have lost like almost half of everything. Also, she had the kids. He He didn't keep the kids. She kept the kids and he went on, you know, to do his business and whatever the case may be. And he only saw them every weekend when he had time. So she had a lot more to gain in a divorce and Jacques had a lot more to lose. Another reason why the couple didn't want to get divorced was because they had both already been divorced before. And also they both had a lot, a lot, a lot of secrets and they could have easily ruined each other. One of the biggest secrets... Oh my god, I've been waiting to say this because it was like, I wanted to spread the secret so bad. Um, One of the bigger secrets about this was that Jacques was actually a gay man. And not that there's anything wrong with that, okay? I'm on Jacques' side. Do it, queen, as you should. 
um, Jacques was gay, and Candy knew that, and Candy was just like, look, I won't tell, if you don't tell, just give me the money, whatever, but Jacques was actually gay, and he didn't want to be outed back then, obviously, being gay was not acceptable, now it's so much more acceptable, and people are actually allowed to be who they want to be, and it's a lot better time, but back then, it wasn't, so Candy was like, listen, listen here she was being a snake she was basically like look if you divorce me and you take you know if you expose my secrets i'm gonna expose your secrets and jacques had a lot of secrets about candy one of the biggest secrets was that she had an affair with her nephew people did not know that she had an affair with her nephew they knew that the couple separated they didn't know why number one and number two they didn't know that it was with her nephew her image would have been like dead at this point like imagine her images would have been dead so they both had like an image to keep up and they were willing to expose each other like listen if you don't say anything i won't say anything but you know just don't say anything so the separation was a lot better option for the couple instead of just plain old divorcing at this point Jacques is living in Key Biscayne, florida and candy is staying in houston at the you know the house with her children and melvin nobody really knows what's going on with melvin right now we're not really sure it's suspected that they still continue their affair even like after jacques moved out and stuff and i can like honestly i can believe that because even during the trial they were still like you know going strong so i believe that they were still you know probably messing with each other secretly but anyway so yeah Jacques moves out Candy's staying with the kids and so like I said before they have this arrangement you know uh Jacques comes to see the kids and then she brings the kids to him so on one particular visit Candy takes the kids to go see Jacques from Houston to Florida so she takes him to Florida she takes him to go see Jacques and they're all hanging out together you know it's not anything out of the ordinary because you know she would bring them to see him sometimes and sometimes he would come to see them so she brings the kids to see Jacques and then she complains of a headache as the visit's going on she starts to complain of a headache and so like no one really saw this as unusual because Candy had documented evidence that she suffered from migraines and stuff and like migraine treatment was not like how it was then like how it is now like you know there's medicine and stuff but you know then there really wasn't a lot of things so she was like i have to go to the hospital because my head is pounding too hard so she decides to take the kids with her to the hospital why i don't <clears throat> look is because she knew something was going on but anyway so she takes the kids with her to the hospital and no less than an hour after she leaves jock's apartment to go to the hospital for a migraine someone breaks into his house and attacks him this is all happening in summer of 1964 i realized i didn't really make the timeline too clear but that's because when i was researching the case the timeline wasn't super clear so the last time i even gave you guys a date on something was back when candy and jacques met in 1949 now this is 1964 so this is over 20 years after they met and they've been married for over 20 years at this point so Yes, I don't want you guys to think that this happened within like a year or two of the meeting. No, this is 20 years in the making. So yes, Jacques is being attacked in his apartment. It is said that when the police found him and found his body, some of the people working the case said it was the most gruesome case they have ever worked on in their entire career. That says something. So when Jacques' body was found, he was found with 39 stab wounds, all over his body, his chest area, his, you know, the side of his body, you know, he had stab wounds everywhere. But those 39 stab wounds was not his cause of death. His actual cause of death was a blow to the head, which is like so crazy to think because it's like he was stabbed 39 times and he still did not die. But just getting hit over the head one time instantly killed him. So the police suspect that when Jacques was being attacked by the robber, you know, they didn't know at this point if it was male or female but when he was being attacked by the robber the robber was just upset that Jacques was not dying you know he was being stabbed all the time and he still wasn't giving up he was still fighting the robber it was said that Jacques put up quite a fight because there was evidence all around the apartment all around the crime scene that Jacques was actually fighting for his life 
And so the police suspect that the robber was becoming like more frantic and more like trying to just kill Jacques, trying to get it over and done with. So they found something in the apartment. At this point, they didn't know what it was, but they did find something super heavy in the apartment and they just smashed Jacques over the head with it one time. And that was what instantly killed him. So at this point, Jacques is murdered. Candy is still at the hospital. The children are still at the hospital. So they're safe. So this is where it just, it gets crazier and crazier. Candy was actually the person to find Jacques' body. She came home from the hospital around 4 a.m. And it was suspected that Jacques was murdered around, you know, 11 p.m. So his body had been sitting there for a while and no one said anything. No one said anything. When police were interviewing the neighbors, some of the neighbors said that they heard like a scuffle going on. Some of the neighbors said that they heard some like, you know, some screaming coming from the apartment. Some neighbors even said that they seen a dark haired man leave the apartment, but like no one said anything. No one called the police, nothing. This is why it, it's kind of good to have nosy neighbors sometimes. Cause it's like, if anything happens, they're going to save you. But these neighbors, like, they were basically useless. I mean, the most interesting tip and the most vital tip that they got was from the woman who said that she seen a dark-haired man leave Jacques' apartment. And that was it. So at this point, the case was open. The police had no leads. They didn't know, you know, what to go off of. Obviously, it was, you know, the dark-haired man leave. But there's dark-haired men all over Florida. It's like you can't pick up everyone and be like, hey, did you murder this guy? So they had nothing at this point. Jacques was murdered on June 30th, 1964. So at this point, the police have nothing. Word about his murder is going around, especially back in Houston, because like I said, people love Jacques. He was like well known and people just liked him. I guess he was a likable person. And so it was going around. The police had nothing. They were canvassing the crime scene, but they really had no solid leads. They know that Jacques, you know, was stabbed 39 times they knew that it was overkill if you don't know what overkill is basically overkill is like when you overkill somebody like you already shot them you don't have to keep shooting them five six seven times but that is what happened to Jacques so the police knew that it was somebody that knew Jacques and someone who had something against Jacques because of how many times he was stabbed but they just didn't know who it was and they really had no leads about who it was so the only thing that they knew it was overkill obviously it was someone who knew Jacques. Other than that, the only other thing that they found in the apartment was a set of bloody fingerprints, but back then DNA testing wasn't even around. Like I said, this is 1964. DNA testing didn't even come out until I believe like the 80s or something. So they literally had nothing. They didn't know if those fingerprints were from Jacques or if they were from the intruder. They had nothing. Jacques' body was wrapped up in like a like a carpet or a blanket or something like it was like such a weird crime scene and they had nothing to go off of until candy gave the police a tip so she was like look he's dead let me go be messy so candy tells the police about Jacques' secret the secret that he was gay and you know no one knew obviously no one knew about the secret except for candy so the police take this into a good consideration because she tells them he was gay and he was known for, you know, being around, hanging around these bars and these clubs and these meetup spots for gay men and blah, blah, blah. And he would take the men home and whatever the case may be. So the police doing their job for once, they actually take this tip into consideration and they start going to the bars that Candy tells Jacques. I mean, that Candy tells the police that Jacques was known to hang out at. They start canvassing the clubs and the social hangouts. But that lead goes cold quickly because they really can't find anything from those places. Um, it wasn't confirmed whether they found anyone that Jacques had actually bought home and had relationships with, but it was just said that it went cold because it was like nobody, they couldn't find anything from those things. So they were back to square one. Barely having any evidence for the case or to even support the case, the, you know, whoever was working on the case, they decide, you know, whatever. We'll go back to the apartment one last time and we'll canvas it just in case. So they canvass the apartment for a final time and that is when they find Jacques' diary, his little diary journal. You know, why everybody in the story is keeping a journal, I don't know. I couldn't really tell you. I don't even think I could justify it, but 
the journal does kind of save Jacques, so, you know, whatever the case may be. Anyway, so, he has his journal, and in his journal, there's a lot of dark stuff about his life. Not about him personally, like, stuff that he's done, you know. He's not throwing his dirt in there, but he's throwing, you know, some evidence in there that the police really need because at this point they have nothing now they have everything so they go through the journal and they see that Jacques is putting stuff down about uh you know Candy and Melvin's affair how you know they were even having an affair in the first place how he was you know scared for his life because Melvin did threaten him and the police take this really serious because they're like you know obviously he would make this up so this is when the police they pick up Melvin and Candy because they're like at this point we're not playing with you. Candy was already low-key a suspect, but they wasn't really going to say that. But now she was like one of the prime suspects along with Melvin. At this point, Candy and Melvin are the prime suspects for killing Jacques. And the police know that whoever was the footman for killing Jacques, you know, the person who physically killed him, they didn't work alone. There was just too much evidence going on for that person to have worked alone. So the police picked them up and they're like, let's go. Like, y'all, we know what y'all did, okay? And as soon as, you know, the police pick up Candy and Melvin for the murder, Candy was not playing. She went and got her and Melvin, one of the top lawyers in the country at the time. His name was Percy Foreman. As you can see, he's on the screen right here sitting with Melvin. You know, that's Melvin and his lawyer. And she was just not kidding. She was like, uh-uh, I'm not going to jail for that. Remember I told you guys that Jacques was murdered on June 30th, 1964, right? The trial did not even start to indict Candy and Melvin for his murder until January 17th, 1966. I can't. Anyways. <laughs> so, the murder trial starts. And the prosecutor's main argument here is that Candy killed Jacques or if she didn't kill him, she had Melvin kill Jacques. You know, they were conspiracy theories and stuff going around. But their main argument was that Candy either killed Jacques or she had Melvin kill Jacques for the simple fact that Jacques was about to take her out of his will and she was not going to get any of the money. So what happened was when Jacques, you know, found out about Candy's affair with Melvin and stuff, he was trying to actively take her out of his will and instead of leaving everything to her and the kids, now he just wanted to leave everything to the kids. So the prosecutor's main argument was that Candy killed Jacques or had him killed before he could do so so that she can claim the money, you know, once he was dead and she can claim the money for her own. It was a great compelling argument, you know, I honestly believe it. Did the court believe it? I don't know. They were losing them. They were literally losing the jury like minute by minute. The prosecutor pulled literally stuff out of the air. They were showing pictures of uh, Melvin and Candy, you know, after Jacques' murder on vacation and all the stuff that she bought him and everything. They were just throwing everything out there. These were all facts. But the jury was just, the jury, oh my God. <laughs> the jury was just like not like, they were not having it, you know? They really wanted to find these two not guilty. I just can't. The case, of course, gained a lot of attention in the media, a lot of attention in the towns, everywhere. Like, everyone was talking about this case. And the prosecutor was slowly losing the jury. How the hell they were losing them, I don't even know. Like, come on. You cannot be serious. But they were losing the jury. So, at this point, they bring in the big guns. You know, they explain that Candy and Melvin were having an affair and they bring evidence, evidence, hardcore evidence from Candy's diary and from Jacques' diary into the courtroom. How they got Candy's diary, I don't know. I'm pretty sure they probably searched the house in Houston and they were like, oh, okay, nasty, I see you. So they had all this evidence against them and people were going crazy, like literally like I said, it had all the elements of like a wet pad story before wet pad even existed. There was money, there was an affair, you know, you know, people love a good affair. Anyways, um, there was incest, you know, no one really, I don't think anyone's really out here for incest, but the whole like affair thing and the money and possible alcoholism and drugs and all of this stuff, you know, people, stuff that people love, stuff that boring people like because, you know, it's not their life. And so people were all over this case and they had to start like, Closing the courtroom, closing the, you know, the doors to the courthouse. They had to start getting security and police presence because people were all over the case. The case was getting super messy and, like, people were divided over this. I don't know how the hell people could even side with Candy and Melvin, but 
yeah whatever the case may be so you know the the case keeps going on and the prosecutor is just trying to nail candy and melvin but they can't do so so on the final day of the case the jury has to decide you know whether candy and melvin you know whether they're free to go whether they did it or whether they're innocent i what do you guys think that they decided what do you guys think that they decided i left a lot of details out of this case for the simple fact of time and trying to save time but all the details i gave you are enough for you yourself to decide what the hell they should have been whether they should have been guilty or whether they should have been innocent and i'm pretty sure a lot of you almost all of you would say guilty what do you think the jury found candy and melvin they found them not guilty i just you know what i just can't i can't i just i can't believe it they found them not guilty basically they stated that while all of you know the evidence you know whatever the case may be it was good or whatever the fact that candy and melvin had an affair and had this little incestuous relationship was not enough to charge them for the case and everything all of the evidence that they found was just circumstantial and it was not enough I'm just going to drink my water and mind my business. Candy and Melvin were both found not guilty of the murder of Jacques Mosser, and they were able to walk free. People, if you think people were all over the case before, they were definitely over the case now. Everyone, not everyone, I can't say everyone, but most people were super outraged because they were like, what the hell? Like, this makes no sense. And Candy and Melvin walked free. They literally walked free. They left the courthouse together and they walked free so people were just like you know what um, a lot of people were happy for them honestly if you look at pictures like people are smiling and like oh my god you know candy congratulations you know you're found not guilty of your husband so they go home they go back to houston you know to their 28 bedroom mansion and they throw a party candy throws a party you know all the neighbors are there everybody is there congratulating her like congratulations candy you just got away with, you know, not murdering your husband, supposedly, quotation marks. And Candy lives happily ever after. Just kidding. So, Candy and Melvin, you know, they go on to stay with each other for a year. But then a year after the trial, the two actually do wind up splitting. I don't know why I have to explain why, you know, a aunt and a nephew continue their illustrious disgusting incestuous relationship but yeah they did and then a year after you know like i said they split up against each other and they just they both decided to go their separate ways after being acquitted of jacques murder candy went over to inherit over 200 million dollars she inherited everything that he left because like i said she was still in his will so this woman was filthy rich she changed all the bank's names to candy monster you know corporation or whatever the case may be and she basically reestablished her image and that was it she got married again one time after but that marriage didn't wind up working out and then candy just went on to live the rest of her life as a single woman you know she was out there doing her thing and then on october 26 1976 she died of a suspected overdose on migraine medication and that was really it for candy's story Melvin, on the other hand, he went on to become an American businessman, but actually this time he did legitimate business, and he did make a fortune for himself. Not much is really known about him after that. It was said that he possibly got married, but again, no one really knows. And then on October 8th, 2010, he wound up dying. That's the end of this case. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed making it. It was really fun. The first time I made it, it did a race, so this was my second time, so it was a lot easier to put the case together. And stop making fun of me. Stop making fun of me. Anyways, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this case. 